All right. Um, the last speaker in this panel is uh, Dr. Nolan Williams. He is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Stanford and director of the Stanford Brain Stimulation Lab. He's a triple board certified neuropsychiatrist, and he develops neuromodulation and psychedelic based treatments for mood disorders, OCD and related conditions. His team pioneered Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy, or SAINT for short, the first non-invasive rapid acting treatment for depression to receive FDA clearance and Medicare reimbursement. Dr. Williams uses neuroimaging guided methods to precisely target and predict treatment response. He also leads clinical trials exploring psychedelic compounds like ibogaine. His research has been uh, recognized with awards from NIMH, Welcome Leap, One Mind Institute, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. A formal dual neurology and psychiatry resident at MUSC, Dr. Williams has been fe featured in Scientific American, New York Times, The Washington Post, CBS Sunday Morning, and today highlighting his impact on neuroscience and mental health care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Doing? Let's see. Ya. All right. Um, my disclosures. All right. So uh, we'll talk through uh, the neuromodulation half of, of the work that uh, we do because uh, it's because of the short period of time. Um, yeah. So I focused a lot of my um, my time thinking about depression because it's the uh, most disabling condition worldwide and it's comorbid with everything. Right. Um, and it makes everything worse that it's comorbid with. So if you have a heart attack and you're depressed, your uh, mortality and morbidity go up. Um, if you if you have sepsis and you're depressed, uh, you do worse. So depression is um, its presence makes everything worse and it's a risk factor for things. And so we can solve that problem and we can solve other risks. Um, and more specifically, we got zoomed into this idea that uh, as a generality, the treatments that we use aren't aligned with the acuity of the problem, right? If I go into the hospital, I'm having chest pain, um, there's a bunch of tests and treatments for me uh, and they happen really quickly. Uh, within a couple of days, and I get I get it sorted out if it's sort outable, right? Um, in the case of uh, depression, you go in, you spend a very long time in the hospital sometimes, and um, the treatments that we give are no different uh, than the ones that you would get in the outpatient setting. And the real problem with that is that the suicide risk for folks triples at discharge, um, and uh, you know, it's the second uh, highest risk factor for suicide, the first being a previous suicide attempt. So it's the only really modifiable risk factor. And um, it makes no sense, right? I shouldn't uh, go out of the hospital after I have a heart attack and have a triple, tripling of my risk of having my second heart attack, right? That doesn't sound so good. So how do we solve kind of that problem? And how do we do it in a week? And so we really started to think a lot about that, right? TMS is a technology has been around um, since the mid eighties as a treatment, experimental therapeutic since the mid nineties as an approved treatment by the FDA uh, for depression um, a little bit before the 2010s, 2008, 2009. And, uh, you know, people looked at it and thought, yeah, this works pretty well. Um, but it's slow and it doesn't work in, um, you know, you know, more than half people, it doesn't remit more than half of people. And so one way of looking at that is kind of looking at it from this kind of way of thinking about a treatment like a pill, right? And that that's, uh, that's just what it is. Um, the other way of thinking about uh, a treatment, and this is kind of the engineering way of thinking about a treatment is to think about it more like a car, right? Uh, the Model T, um, or like a scalpel. The Model T uh, worked, but none of you are driving that, right? Um, and engineering advancements over time have made that technology better. The first surgery uh, using a scalpel probably didn't go that well. You know, maybe it went okay. It certainly doesn't go, you know, it didn't go as well as the same surgery performed here at Stanford today, right? Because we've developed an understanding of that tool. 
And so I say all that to say that I want you to think about TMS like that. TMS is a device that induces a current in underlying brain circuits by using a high powered magnet and pulsing that magnet and using Faraday's law to induce uh, current generation and electrically conducting substances. You do this over uh, sand at the beach, it doesn't do anything. You do it over brain circuits and you can turn, you do it in the right way, you can turn them on and you actually modify them. And so that's what TMS does. The first kind of set of TMS experiments were in retrospect, probably overly cautious and, um, and under precise. And we're able to modify some brain circuitry in some people and have some results. And then there was a, a natural kind of evolution of the technology to improve it, but it was more of a, an evolution than a revolution, right? To where the 1995 kind of approach um, you know, generated a few people in response remission. And then by uh, 2008, 2009, you get this um, kind of treatment protocol that um, doesn't really solve the clinical problem that I just spoke about, but um, can get people well in the kind of normal schedule of about six weeks. Um, since then, there's been um, a, an advancement on uh, how the stimulation signals in the brain. The first kind of way of doing it was uh, derived from just like, you know, kind of parametric studies where you just vary the frequency, but we didn't know that much. Um, this kind of second generation of parameters was derived from recording in mammalian brain tissue, mammalian hippocampus, and then playing it, um, playing it back through the TMS coil uh, into the brain and then activating uh, the brain in a similar sort of way to the way that, um, that the brain signals itself, right? And so that's, that's called data burst. It uses um, you know, signals that are similar to the way that the brain signals itself. And, and by doing that, it, it produces a uh, kind of a step function of efficiency. So instead of um, the stimulation taking almost an hour, it can take a couple of minutes and produce the same changes in excitability. And so this is the this is the sort of readout that we use. So we use uh, this motor evoked potential readout to understand uh, how the technology is modifying the cortical excitability. We do this over the motor system because it's easily measurable and uh, intermittent data burst produces excitation. And so we know that if you then take that excitatory stimulation approach and you play it into prefrontal circuitry, you can actually produce a similar effect um, to the old way of doing it, right? And so the, this is Jonathan Downer and Jeff Daskalaskis's work showing that um, if you play that same, um, that same older kind of rhythm that was originally approved against the hippocampal rhythm, you can get a similar sort of clinical improvement, right? And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to re-engineer the approach such that you're able to solve that clinical problem, right? And that clinical problem is how do you bake the cake faster? How do you make the stimulation work over a shorter period of time for more people? And so the first set of questions is around, well, what's the kind of fundamental unit? And in this case, the fundamental unit is that data burst approach I just described to you, but there's a catch, right? There's kind of this dose intensity um, sweet spot um, that's been kind of identified across a couple of different studies where you need sub, sub motor threshold dose, so kind of actually lower intensity and a certain amount of pulses, in this case, 1800. And that's the that's kind of the um, unit, if you will. Is there a better one uh, with more experimentation? I'm sure there is. Um, but for pragmatic purposes, we landed on that as actually this is a paper published in Brain about a decade ago, uh, showing that that sort of uh, 1800 pulse dose and then intensity that submotor threshold is effective even when it's applied once a day. And then the second thing, right, is we know what the unit is or the amount of stimulation. And then the second thing we wanted to kind of know was once you had that, 
what is the repetition rate, right? How quickly can you stimulate again such that you're able to get the person's uh, brain to receive the first stimulation and kind of get it to a place where when you stimulate again, it will optimally interact. Um, what I just said may, may have gone, uh, you know, over you or some, or, uh, you know, you, you, you don't, uh, you won't process that in your normal life of what is that, what does that really mean? But I'll give it to you in a different way. How many of you um, have used note cards to study? Right? How many of you wrote one note card down and looked at it 50 times and then never looked at it again? Maybe one. All right. How many of you wrote out 60 note cards and looked at each one of them for a minute and then got back to the first note card about an hour later? The ones of you, all right. are there other ways? I'd be interested. There's a couple of you in the audience that uh, did like the 500 note cards and never got back, right? Uh, I know those ones. So most people actually intuitively know this principle of space learning. And the reason why you know is because this is kind of optimally how people will learn, right? And so that idea of writing out 60 note cards and getting back to the original note card has been, um, has been observed over and over again in psychological experiments. And these basic science experiments where you can actually stimulate and, and measure dendritic spine enlargement and then stimulate again at varying um, intercession intervals, you can see the same principle played out again, whether you do it at the hippocampal slice level or you do it at the psychological student experiment level, the, the story is the same story, which is it's about an hour. You need about an hour of exposure uh, to kind of optimally interact. And there've been a number of, of accelerated data burst studies where they didn't do this and they didn't get any clinical benefit. And so that's kind of principle one, it's the how. The second principle that we've thought a lot about is the how much, right? And so TMS was uh, dramatically underdosed with its original uh, dosages. Uh, Seroquel was dramatically underdosed with its original dosages for, for schizophrenia, right? We were giving people 100, 200 milligrams of Seroquel when it first came out. There's a lot of examples in medicine where we were cautious and we gave too little and then we said, oh, maybe this doesn't work that well. But then if you keep going, you take, in this case, all the people that didn't really do that well with conventionally applied TMS and you just simply give them more weeks of stimulation, you convert two thirds of them over to be responders. And so this idea of not just how, but also how much, how much do you need to put into the system um, to get the person to a place where they're, um, where they're able to respond. And so this is the way we were thinking about it. This idea of applying, again, this kind of hippocampally derived um, stimulation approach. And we're able to do that um, over a period of time of two seconds with an eight second inner train interval that produces excitations we talked about earlier. And then we give nine minutes of that in the way that we're applying this accelerated approach with a, um, with a 50 minute intercession interval uh, to recapitulate that learning principle. And so by doing that, we're able to actually apply a lot of stimulation over a short period of time. We're actually able to apply an entire six week course over a single day of the originally approved data burst stimulation. And that allows for us to get people well in a short period of time. I've had patients that have been really in severe shape to totally well after one day, but the average is about 2.6 days. And it's just really reorganizing the stimulation in time. Right, and then giving the amount of dose that you need um, with the reorganization in time. Does it make sense? <clears throat> so then the third principle is this principle of where, and, and there's kind of the macro where within the named brain region, right? And then the micro where within, I'm sorry, uh, which named brain region, and then the micro where uh, within a named, the named brain region. And so, Left or lateral prefrontal was really the area that's been studied the most for stimulation. 
And then we really thought a lot about where within the left or lateral. It's like a five or six centimeter spread. The old way of thinking about TMS is that it's got this broad um, induced E field, but the newer kind of experiments in macaques show us that actually the induced spiking is really quite narrow. And so, you know, you have sub centimeter um, induced activity. And so if you put uh, uh, kind of a, a circle that has a diameter of about a centimeter within um, a larger circle of a five or six centimeter, centimeter spread, there's a lot of stimulation targets within that bigger brain region, right? So not everywhere is gonna be the same. This work was done and inspired what we, um, you know, why we started doing targeting by Mike Fox's group. It's one of the most replicated findings uh, neuroimaging and psychiatry. And it's basically the, you know, if you use normal targeting, the kind of skull-based targeting, the linear distance to the ideal target, um, the shorter that is, the better people do. There's a, there's a study that was just finished out of Harvard where they did connectivity targeting versus, um, versus the standard uh, skull-based targeting. And they had a Cohen's D of 0.92 of connectivity targeting on the clinical effect just a massive effect. And so what do we do? We're, we're looking for the where, where within the brain network, um, where within the dorsolateral kind of optimally interacts with the subgenual anterior cingulate. And that's what we're trying to target. We use hierarchical clustering to cluster similarly behaving voxels that, um, that allow for us to have kind of a cluster to deal with within the dorsolateral. And then we ask the question of what its connectivity is to the subgenual. <clears throat> and then when we do that, we're able to then uh, produce an individualized brain target that's capable of interacting with the subgenual cingulate in, a, in an ideal uh, way. And that functional position is different in everybody. And the structural position is different in everybody. And the skull spot is different in everybody. And so this idea that you can somehow derive a skull spot that's gonna tell you where to go uh, doesn't work as I'm sure neuroradiology friends will attest. Um, so this is the, the stimulation approach. This is just another way of thinking about it. Um, this is our first trial. Uh, people were 50% of them were on disability for depression, average length of current illness, nine years, average length of lifetime illness, about 25 years. Uh, Cohen's D effect size is above one across all of that. I'm going to skip through this because I'm out of time. I'll just show you. And this is, a, this is actually accepted by World Psychiatry and uh, published in a month or two. This is our replication trial funded by uh, NIMH um, and very similar um, effects to the original uh, original trial. So really quite excited about that. Um, yeah. And go through, this is all my folks and, uh, wouldn't be here without all their support and the support of our funders. Thank you very much.